Hello and welcome to Reef Talk. I'm Scott Anderson with Mile High Reefers. I'm here with Steve Rotter of Rotter Tube Reef. And we have our special guest, Michael Ahrens from Ahrens Aquarium. How's so, it going, guys? Michael, it's great having you on the show. So you have a great channel, an awesome tank, and you're going to talk to us today about something you feel very passionate about. You're big on the dry rock thing. So can you kind of talk to us a little bit about why you think dry rock is the way to go in the aquarium hobby? Well, when it comes to dry rock, um, it's something that I'm, I'm pushing very hard at the moment. It's because the way the hobby is nowadays is we, we're moving on. There's new things out for us to be able to progress. And a lot of people are still you know, very much in the old school. I call it the old school and the new school. You know, you've still got the old school with the live rock, live sand situation, you know, having to sit on a tank for six, seven, eight, nine, ten weeks while it cycles, etc., etc. Whereas now you've got loads of different advancements on, um, you know, bacteria in a bottle, etc., etc. So live rock is no longer required in my eyes because with live rock, yes, you, you do get the odd few um, bonuses when you get live rock. So you'll get like a, a coral coming in or some nice bit of clean up crew, etc., etc. But at the same time, there's also far too many unknowns for my liking. You know, you can bring in Aptasia, you know, you can bring in, you know, Flatworm, as well as all of the other parasites that you can bring in, like White Spot, Velvet, etc. So for me, Nowadays, live rock is no longer essential or no longer needed. Back in the day when it was the Berlin Method times and you had to have loads and loads and loads of rock and all of that, then yes. But now, you know, we've advanced so far that, you know, we can get things like Bio Home Media, Ciparax, um, ATM Colony, all of these different things to be able to start up a tank in days and also to be able to have like minimal rockscapes nowadays. You don't have to have tons and tons and tons of rock. You can literally just throw all your um, like biological media stuff, like your bio home and your Ciprax in your sump, and have just a couple of rocks if you wanted, just keep it you know, really minimal. So like I said, when it comes to the whole live rock situation, it's like, for me, there's far too many knowns um, in it and it, you just see so many people like I, I'm very active on Facebook and every time I get messages on Facebook and you see people like I've just started up my tank, I'm cycling, I've got hair algae, you know, I've got this, I've got that. And they've not even got the first fish yet. And it's like they're already fighting an uphill battle. You know what I mean? So for me, starting off at the most sterile way as possible, dry rock, dry sand, dry everything, you know, everything as clean as it possibly can be will give you the best start in your hobby. Now, I think when we're talking about live rock versus dry rock, it's important to point out that we're talking about the starting medium. It's yeah. going to be your dry rock starting with, but in the long run, your dry rock is going to become live rock. Yes. So I think that's an important um, distinction for people to make. It's not that we're against or I'm not completely against live rock at all, but it's not that dry rock people are against live rock completely. It's just the starting medium. I think in the end, we're all going to have tanks full of live rock is the goal. Yeah. Well, the thing is as well, when it comes to, you know, in the future, as your rock becomes live, it's become live um, around your parameters, around you. You know, you've made that rock, you know, whatever's in that rock is stuff that you've added to the tank, not stuff that's coming in without you knowing. So Steve, what did you start with? Dry rock or live rock in your system? Uh, I started with um, live rock. And, you know, I wanted to, you know, just say for those starting in the hobby who don't know <clears throat> what the hell we're talking about, pardon my Italian, Dry rock is literally dry. You just buy it off the shelf at the oh, store. It? Live rock, it's live because, not because the wa the rock walks around, although that would be kind of cool. <laughs> but it's got bacteria living on it, and the bacteria breaks down the ammonia and all the bad things in the tank. So that's the difference. Um, I started out with live rock because that's what you had to have, and that's what the uh, local reef store was just, you know, too happy to sell me at an overpriced rate 
Um, you know, you gotta have this because if you don't, your tank will crash and all that, whatever. So yeah. you gotta have bacteria in the tank. Get a lot of live rock. In other words, give us a lot of money. So um, I'm with Michael on this. Um, get the dry rock because, I mean, live rock is great. It's great. But for all the reasons he said, I agree with that. Also, um, you know, you know, the biggest thing is bringing in something bad. Like, you know, there's a couple fish swimming in that big tank um, of live rock. You, you get some live rock home, you bring some uh, parasites in there that will multiply rapidly and kill your fish. We're talking about white spot or ick or, God forbid, marine velvet. It will kill everybody in there within hours. Um, marine velvet will. So, for that reason, um, you know... I get the dry rock now, but I started with the live, yeah. and uh, one good reason why I'm glad I started with the live a while ago is I bought one decent-sized live rock that had coralline algae all over it, and that's the purple rock. The coralline yeah. algae is very good. It's a sign that your tank is matured. Um, Mike's got some back there, I think. Um, so I know. I've got, I've got this. Beautiful. So this, this is actually carob sea life rock so this is dry rock yes. but painted painted purple painted so it gives purple. you a little bit of a natural look when you first get going um but you know something like that it's dry there's no parasites in right. it it's clean there's so nothing it's living on it it's clean it, you know there's nothing living on it so like i said when you start your system up when this eventually becomes live it'll be live around you. You know, right. you won't have added any nasties, so there won't be any nasties in it. It'll just be, you know, positive um, stuff that's in here. Well, that's the plan anyway. Yeah, and dry yep. rock is also cheaper. It's it's safer. Again, nothing against live rock, but it's safer because you're not bringing in any critters from the ocean, any critters or parasites from the store. It's just you get it off the shelf, and it's cheaper. Again, like I said, I literally yeah. will just get the rock I'll rinse it off in uh, purified water, and I'll just stick it right in the tank. I don't do the whole letting it propagate and sit around for weeks. With I just don't do that. Um, so, as Michael said, you can get bacteria in a bottle. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a friend with an aquarium, you can just take a few scoops of their sand, put it in yours, providing there's it's parasite-free, of course. Um, get a live rock. Also, the big thing, get a large sponge and let it just sit in their sump for a few weeks to a month let it let that bacteria grow on that sponge you put it in your tank it's gonna be, it's gonna be a great starting point to let that bacteria grow and fester in your aquarium so um, kind of for a me as well though, answer you know, but i like the dry rock yeah so i think for me as well though on that situation sorry just where you sure. were saying about you know getting another person's tank to seed yours that's something else that i wouldn't do because again, you know, you don't know what's in their system. Right. Um, it's like the old school method of people taking water from somebody else's tank. And it's like, you've just taken water from somebody else's system and, you know, beneficial bacteria next to none of it lives in the water anyway. It's all on surfaces. So you're basically taking water from somebody else's system, putting it in yours. And all you're doing is bringing their phosphates and nitrates with you. So again, you're starting off on a bad foot. When it comes to seeding things in other people's systems, Again, you know, they could have, um, well, I don't know what your stance is in this, but as far as I'm concerned, every single reef tank, any tank that's got corals has got white spot. Um, it's just at a low level where, you know, if your fish are happy and healthy, you don't see it. But as soon as those fish become stressed, ill, then all of a sudden, bang, you've got a white spot outbreak. And if they've, if you've seeded something in their system, then you potentially bring in white spot, bring in... God forbid, like you said, velvet to your system. And again, you're starting off on, you know, a sort of like, in my eyes, a negative footing. You know, there's all sorts of different ways now to, like I said, to get going without um, seeding from other systems and things like that. Now, I agree exactly with what Michael said. So I'm going to step back one and say, like I said, if you know someone's tank is disease free and whatnot that's when i would do it but stepping up back um as a last resort i would do that if you wanted to try and cycle it faster but only of course if there's no fish in the tank and there shouldn't be any fish in the tank if you're trying to cycle it so i would leave it empty for six weeks which is enough time to kill anything off that may be in there because most of those parasites feed off those fish 
So, but yeah, I, 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 I do that, and I, I forgot to interject. When I set up my JBJ45 aquarium, because I know what my 125 is, yeah. that's yeah. how I seated from that. So well, as a last resort, well, I suppose use, use in a friend, that situation, yeah. follow if it's your Mike, own. what Mike said, yeah. and just let it, let it mature on its own. Start ground zero clean. Let that bacteria grow naturally from what you put in it. That's the best way to go. And then, of course, go slow. A lot of people don't. I'm guilty of it too, and you know, I'm you guilty. Have to <laughs> uh, everybody who watches yep. my channel knows I am well guilty for doing everything <laughs> far too fast. Well, not too fast, but very it's fast. Exciting to get <laughs> stuff. So I think there's a couple important points to make here. The dry rock is much cheaper. Um, the carob sea that you just showed is really nice. They make um, a non-colored version that's even cheaper than that stuff. Mm -hmm. I got an 80 pound or a 40 pound box of it for 80 bucks, which compared to live rock is just ridiculously cheap. I think live rock, usually minimum you're looking at is like eight bucks a pound in the U S mm -hmm. when that stuff was two bucks a pound. So as, as a cost, it's like unbeatable for dry rock. And well, then if you think about it, when you're buying live rock, you're buying it by the weight. Right. You? Yeah. So you're paying for water. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then the, I wanted to also make the distinction that there's two different types of live rock out there. You have the stuff that is put in a box and wrapped in newspaper yeah. and shipped yeah. halfway across the world on a boat. Mm -hmm. And then um, is maybe, if you're lucky, air shipped to you. But most of that stuff is live rock in the fact that the bacteria and maybe some of your coralline is on there. But you've got massive death in that rock. Right. Mm. The really good live rock is the stuff that is air shipped directly from the place that it was gathered from to the reef's <clears throat> wholesaler and then air shipped to the customer. That is the really good live rock. And I think somebody could maybe make a case for if you really wanted to establish a system that was as true to nature as possible, that you could maybe say something like that. But I haven't bought live rock in years. The last stuff I got, I got from a friend who was shutting down a tank. The stuff I got before that was about 10 years ago. So I guess I'm pretty much in the dry rock camp. It's just cheaper and there's no pests that I'm bringing in. And it sounds like the three of you or the two of you are on the same boat. Do you guys have a favorite type of dry rock you like to use? I like well, Pocani. before, so, uh, um, to be honest, I'm I'm currently I'm on my new system. I'm about to use well, there's one or two rocks that I'm going to use, but they're basically the same thing: uh, Marco rock or pure rock. Um, these these something new to me. Um, when it comes to rock, for me, rock's rock. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know the names and all that. Like, sure. you know, it's rock's rock for me. Right. But one thing that going on to the live rock situation as well is, you know, when you know so people go to the the local fish store or they go to somebody's home to buy rock. Um, one thing as well with it is, you know, when people say, "Oh, it's very mature" and all of that, that is, we're getting rock most of the time. We're getting this rock as a surface area, we need it for bacteria. Yep. Now, if that rock is 10 years old, uh, you know, whatever else, in that period of time, the waste that has been in that system has got compacted into those pores, you know, blocked up that rock. So people, are, it's like you're buying inferior rock, you know, because it hasn't got the surface area that it did when it was first, you know, first cultivated, first put into to somebody's tank. And it's like, uh, I don't get it. <laughs> you know well, what? That's part a, of it is. That's a really good that's point. That's, sorry. That's something that um, Scott asked me earlier was how long have I been in the Hobbit? And I've only been actually, I've only been an actual reef keeper for a year and a half. And I've only been in the hobby for two years. So I think for me, because I'm so new, I've never been over that side. You know, I've never had to have live rock. I've never had to think so for me, you know, looking from the outside in, so to speak, it's it, it's very alien to me. Well, That's part of what really I like to point, say though. is um, my five gallon nano, I started up with um, Tonga Live Rock, which is from the original system that I started up my 29 gallon 10 years ago. Mm. And it was an instant cycle. I put that stuff in because I've had it for 10 years and that tank was ready to go. I 
waited like a day before I added Coral to that system. Yeah. It was well, flawless. This, this, this one here is um, four weeks old now. It's packed. There's no yeah. more room for anything else. On week, um, at the end of week one, it looked like this. You know, so, and what you're right. saying about, you, you seeded yours with like, you know, your tongue live rock from your old system. I just put that in, you know. Yep. I just put a bottle of that in. And it's just, it's basically the same thing. Um, and that sort of like goes back to what we were talking about earlier about seeding from other people's systems. It's like, for me, no. But I have also got another tank over there. Um, so, you know, we can bounce the two and, sure. you know, seed the two. But with my new system, my new 420 gallon system, nothing from these two will go in that system. That system will start up completely sterile. Nothing from these two will go in because I don't, I, you know, obviously that's going to cost me a lot of money. Right. So I don't want that worry of, right. you know, putting putting things in that, um, you know, that I don't think so. You know, even though these two are running great, there's still potentially stuff in here that, uh, well, actually probably not this one because this was all completely dry and sterile. So, but I like that one, so I don't want to shut it down. <laughs> so, on my 24 gallon, I'm pretty much going old school. Um, I seeded it with bacteria from the five gallon, where most of that stuff's gonna in the five gallon's gonna end up. So, talk me through how the bacteria in the bottle worked and how you were able to get that much coral in that tank in a week. Well, basically, it's it goes down the same lines and the same situation of what you've just done with your Tonga branch. You know what um, Steve was talking about seeding a sponge in somebody else's system or anything. Um, we've actually brought the nitrifying bacteria into the tank. We've added it straight away, and obviously, with with a bottle like this, it, it tells you, you know, for what size tank um, you you know it's for. So that is adding enough bacteria into your system to to consume that ammonia straight away. So when you go to test your tank, you know, I started off with three clownfish and anemones, and there was never an ammonia reading because the bacteria is already there. Um, and, you know, and then from there on out, it's just, you know, zero readings, and then you see nitrate. And then for nitrate, I've got Biohome Media in the back, which has got, you know, some really good um, anaerobic areas. So that keeps the uh, nitrate down as well. And, just having that balance of you know the right types of bacteria in the system because I don't know like a lot of people think that it's just one type of bacteria that's doing it all, but basically like you have um, one type of bacteria that eats your ammonia, then that poos out nitrite, <laughs> and then there's another bacteria that eats the nitrite, and then that poos out nitrate, and then there's another bacteria that will eat. Um, that leak nitrate but it's you know we don't tend to uh, get a lot of that because most systems don't have very um a lot of anaerobic areas because again not a lot of uh, systems anymore run deep sand beds or run areas uh, like big areas of anaerobic areas so you know starting this tank up uh, that fast it's just a simple case of you know just having the right type of bacteria in the system right away and not putting well, not putting too much in, even though there is technically a lot in there. <laughs> Did you experience a diatom bloom with your tank? Uh, no. Um, wow. Well, if you, I don't know if you've seen the videos, but the original idea for this tank was to purposely grow hair algae in here. Right. <laughs> uh, the, it was that was the idea because what I wanted to show people because a lot of people tend to struggle with hair algae. Um, and you know, hair algae needs three things to you know to survive. It needs oxygen, it needs nutrients, and it needs light. So you know, I was trying to show people that you don't have to go out and buy all these lotions and potions and things to be able to kill hair algae off. So obviously, the plan was to get hair algae to grow. So you know, was expecting diatom blooms, I was expecting you know algae blooms and all that. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I've been overfeeding, I've it, overstocked, you know, and it's like, God. <laughs> it's kind of what you want as a new hobbyist, though. You kind of just want it to work. Yeah, yeah that's it. I, it. You know, I actually wanted this tank to be an issue. You know, I wanted it to be an issue, and it hasn't been. But I put money on it as soon as I start up my 420, and I don't want it to be an issue. I, that either. will go absolutely <laughs> mental. But I suppose it's one thing to say to a lot of people as well is, um, 
you know, when they're starting up a tank for the first time, they say, right, I'm just going to get a couple of clowns and then I'll move on to soft corals and then, you know, I'll move on to LPS and SPS. And it's, and I tend to say to people, it's, that's not necessarily the case. You know, it's all about your understanding of the hobby. It's all about your knowledge. You know, if you've got a good knowledge of the hobby, you've got a good knowledge of, you know, what needs to be done. You can set up a system today and have SPS in it if you want it, as long as you understand how you're keeping it and all of that. You know, one thing that we are, we're water keepers. We're not fish keepers. We're not coral yeah. keepers. They can sort themselves out. So, you know, for a lot of people, they always tend to go down the, you know, the, the up the ladder. Fish, softies, LPS, SPS. Right. It's like, if you actually understand what you're doing, you know, you don't really need to, to, to follow that ladder. But, you know, if, if you don't, then do follow, you know, do, do do that way. But you make a great point because if your ultimate goal is to have SPS and you start off with a bunch of anemones and softies and then go to LPS, you got a bunch of stuff in your tank that really aren't real compatible with the mm. SPS corals you eventually want to get to. Yeah. So it's good to have that plan to begin with. Yeah, that's it. And that's um, something with with this new system that I'm setting up, that's something that I'm going to be preaching a lot as well is is preparation. You know, this system that I've created now is is fully planned, you know, from from getting the tank to the equipment to everything. Basically, I know every stage, even coral placement. I don't know what corals I'm getting, but, you know, for example, euphilias. I know where all my euphilias are already going to go. You know, I know where the SPS are already going to go and uh, things like that because of the way that I've planned the flow and the lighting. So for a lot of people, just getting that little bit of knowledge before they decide to buy that, that tank will make everything, you know, just that little bit easier. And, uh, you know, that I know a lot of people don't, you know, it's, I've got a tank, yeah, let's set it up quickly. <laughs> and that's me. I've been there, I've done that, you know, and I'm only in this situation now because I did start there. But I think with the likes of, you know, me, you, um, doing things like this can help people not have to go through that not have to waste all of that money not have to throw all that money away and just be able to start off on a good foot well and i think um getting back to our original subjects when you're talking about making it easy for a new hobbyist nothing beats dry rock yeah the the live rock is cool to look at but from an ease of use standpoint the dry rock's unbeatable yeah, well, that's it as well because, like you said, when um, when you use live rock, and a lot of people, when they're, say, for example, if they're cycling using live rock, um, the tank's empty, but this it's still it's a very new thing for them, and they're excited. You know, they've got this new reef tank. They're excited. They want to see it. You know, everything else. So they have the lights on. Um, and there's nothing in there, so they don't need the lights, and that's where the hair algae comes in. And you know, so like when you're saying about ease of use, they've got hair algae because they've got the lights on, so it's growing. And you know, if that was dry, you wouldn't have that issue as right. much, but you would get it if you know, obviously, because obviously the nutrients are going to be there because you're going to be feeding them with a uh, dose of ammonia or whatever else you're doing to to uh, to get that tank seeded. Well, I think with when you start with live rock, you end up introducing a lot more nutrients than you would if you were starting with dry rock. Yeah. Well, it's like, I, I, I forgot who said it now, but when you, um, when you get the live rock in and yeah, it was you that said it's got, when you've had it shipped in and there's so much death in that rock, you know, you've got like dead bristle worms in there. You've got dead all sorts in there. As soon as you put that in that tank, that is going to be what is the stimulus for the growth of, um, uh, of your bacteria because all of the ammonia that these dead bodies are creating is what is going to stimulate you know your bacteria to grow but you've got all of those dead bodies in there yeah. so you know before you know it once your cycle's complete you're gonna have like nitrates of like a hundred because there's so much you know waste being produced at such an yeah. early stage so um so yeah again you know just for me to like it <laughs> Well, I think that's probably a pretty good place to end this episode of Reef Talk. Um, Michael, thank you for being on. Um, Steve, you got anything before we go? No, no. You guys covered everything. Uh, I agree with what you guys both said. I'm a big supporter of the dry rock for everything Michael said. And uh, I haven't said it, but Michael, thanks for being on the show. We're going to have you on the future ones if you'd like to be on them. Uh, your channel is awesome, by the way. Yes. Very, very nicely done. And if you guys have not checked out uh, Michael's channel, um, please do so. There's going to be a link to it 
in the description below. So check it out and subscribe to him because you'll learn a lot. It's very entertaining as well. Thank and you very much. that tank looks awesome. I can't wait to see. When do you think that 420 is going to be up? Um, I've just I've, I've actually been up to the place that's uh, building it. I went up the other day because they've uh, allowed me to do a few videos oh, there. Nice. So they've oh, let me... Yeah. Uh, yeah, they've let me do a few videos on how to like cut glass and how to drill tanks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I've got a bit of um, video footage there for for the channel. So, uh, the 420, we're going to be looking at about two weeks, three weeks max, and it's here. I've actually just—I don't know if you've seen this, the 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 frame build video. Um, I've just built the frame for it, and uh, that's now got the sump inside. It's oh, all been nice. um, boarded out, so that's yep. going to be this weekend's reef update so that'll be on sunday fantastic um, and then yeah so two three weeks max and the that'll fun be will awesome. begin Sweet. <laughs> florida ceiling reef i can't wait 